It's been a pretty big road so far, yeah? Electronics is a huge deal, antennas are a huge deal, and the atmosphere is sort of the thing keeping us alive. Pretty big stuff. This video we're going to relax a bit and focus on modulation and equipment. I think there's only one math problem in this whole thing. To start, we need to talk about how to send information via radio waves, and to do that we need to talk about bandwidth. When we say a signal is on a specific frequency, what we actually mean is that the signal is being sent on a chunk of the RF spectrum focused on that frequency. The more information that is sent, the more bandwidth that it takes up. Morse code takes up less bandwidth than voice, and voice takes up less bandwidth than video. It's also notable that the more information you try to jam down a signal, the less range you're going to get, because you're using what energy you've got to convey a wider width of the band. Thus, bandwidth. As an aside for the test, this is why we have to be careful when we try to transmit on the edge of the ham radio band. If we transmit so close to the band edge that our signal goes over the edge, we're breaking the rules. This is considered bad and wrong. Modulation is one of the most important parts of making radio what it is. Modulation is changing a thing to convey information. For example, I'm sitting at this desk, modulating a piece of paper with ink to poorly convey information to you. The reverse effect is called demodulation. You're looking at my graphics, discerning what you can from my crummy handwriting, demodulating what I'm sending you. So it's not enough to just have an RF signal. You have to do something to it to carry information. The simplest way to do this is to just turn the damn thing on and off. In electrical engineering, this is a type of on-off keying, or oh, okay, but that's not on the test. In ham radio, we call this continuous wave, or CW, because we're doing nothing to change the RF at all. It's just a simple sine wave on the same frequency whenever it transmits. There's actually a lot of ways that CW can be used to convey information, and I could spend an hour talking about it. But in ham radio, when we say CW, what we're talking about is Morse code in its purest form. As you likely know, Morse code is made up of a series of dashes and dots, which in this case are pulses of transmission. Turn the transmitter on for a long pulse, you have a dash, which is called a da. Turn the transmitter on for a short pulse, you have a dot, which is called a dit. In my example here, I have da dit da dit, which means I have turned the transmitter on for a long pulse, a short pulse, another long pulse, and then a final short pulse. According to Morse code, I have sent the letter C. Being the simplest modulation method, CW takes up the least amount of bandwidth and therefore can make the most range. You know what? I'm going to let you in on a little secret here. I don't know Morse code, and I don't even like Morse code. Like, not that much. You're going to meet people during the weekend who absolutely love it and swear by it, and I do not deny its many advantages when they talk about them. They're absolutely right. And I guess my heart is even warming to it. But for most of my life, I thought it was pretty boring. I hope you'll find something you like in ham radio. It's entirely possible that this ends up being the hobby for you. But just like me in Morse code, I don't think you're going to love everything, and I think it's entirely possible that this doesn't summon your banana corn at all. Don't be afraid of that, and don't be afraid to communicate it to us. We're introducing and inviting, and we're happy you're here, regardless of what you discover. Okay, back to it, but a little bit out of order. From one of the oldest to something a lot newer, we're going to talk about frequency modulation. Frequency modulation, aka FM, varies its frequency to modulate RF like a sound wave. Receiving FM also leads to the capture effect, which means that the transmitting station captures a receiver so that you only hear one station at a time. When two stations try to transmit simultaneously, it sounds pretty bad unless there's a station that's much stronger, in which case that's the station you get. Related to the capture effect, FM is also pretty good at rejecting noise. It takes up quite a bit of bandwidth comparatively, which is why we avoid it on the HF bands, where we really need the distance and we don't have a lot of bandwidth to spare. The FM broadcast band obviously uses this modulation, but so do our camp radios, as well as the radio you'll receive if you pass your test. It's often used for data on UHF and VHF, and that's FM in a nutshell. Okay, moving on with modulation. After CW, the next simplest method of modulating an RF wave is to change its amplitude, the electrical up and down that makes a wave look like a wave. If I draw a wave with varying amplitude, you can kind of see another wave entirely being drawn if I connect the peaks together. That phantom wave is the information we're sending. This is amplitude modulation, also known as AM. 
It uses a lot less bandwidth than FM, but more than CW. Also, unlike FM, you can hear multiple stations simultaneously. This is sometimes good, sometimes bad. Outside of ham radio, AM is most often heard on the AM broadcast band. You know, the band that electric car makers want to pretend doesn't exist. As great as AM works, it's not what we use on HF for the most part. You see, an AM signal is made up of a center carrier signal and two side bands. But for the sake of efficiency, what if you could get rid of that carrier frequency and one of the side bands while you're at it? Doing that would save energy, it would save a lot of bandwidth, and it would also sound funny. Sort of like Star Wars radio chatter. We do that, and it's called single sideband. One question, though. Which side of the band do you use? Well, of course, both. Simply, below 10 MHz, we use lower sideband. Above 10 MHz, we use upper sideband. It's a convention, but it is easy to remember. Sometimes one can modulate too much, and unsurprisingly, we call this overmodulation. While it will work differently and have different effects depending on what kind of radio and mode you're using, fixing it is almost always the same and pretty simple. Talk quieter and people can hear you better. If your radio has a mic gain knob, turn it down. Otherwise, back off on the microphone. Let the radio do the yelling part. All right, you might have noticed I have a lot of these, but let's look at my current handheld radio. As I mentioned earlier, this one works with FM modulation. You may notice that it has a longer, somewhat less sucky antenna on it. Still a compromise, but it works better than a standard rubber duck. Notice that it has these buttons on the front with numbers. When I want to use a frequency, I can directly enter it in using these numbers. Let me dork around with it for a minute. Okay, here, I will enter in 146.520. the National Simplex Calling Frequency. Cool. Okay, handheld radios, also called handy talkie or HT radios, all have fixed mic gain. If you overmodulate an FM, it's often called overdeviating. And if you're overmodulating, you have to talk quieter or more likely move your mouth away from the microphone. Since, again, fixed gain. Okay, so I entered 146.52 in, right? But if I don't want to remember all the numbers and codes for talking to certain stations and all that stuff, most radios have a built-in memory function. As you can see, I've got a number of repeaters already programmed in. What are repeaters? We'll we'll talk about them later. You're going to like those. Also, if it's not obvious this radio is new enough to me that I'm still learning how to use it, but I did manage to program my call sign into the power on image. Okay, now we gotta talk about carrier squelch. To understand squelch, you have to know that when a radio is tuned into a frequency that does not have a signal on it, you'll hear static. Static is loud and noisy. To deal with that noise, most VHF and UHF radios have something called squelch. Here, check it out. So, this is an annoying way to use the radio. Annoying how so? Well, there's all this noise when I try to use it, like when you're not talking. It's like there's a lot of static, Um, but there's no problem with you. It's almost like I've got the squelch turned all the way down. Yeah, this seems a lot quieter. Uh, do I sound any different to you? You sound a lot happier, but not much different. Glad that things are sounding better on your end. All right. It's almost like the squelch function allows camp to happen, you know, without uh, everybody's radio constantly making noise. Boy, that would be terrible and annoying if all the radios all the time were just open and making sounds at all times. Well, fortunately, we have the squelch function. Squelch function. I can talk. Thank you very much. N9, MII, clear. Clear. 
A squelch circuit mutes the audio output of the radio unless it detects a signal on frequency. This prevents us from having to hear static when nothing is happening. On a weaker station, the squelch might not allow a signal through, or it might cut in and out intermittently. Sometimes squelch is a distinct knob, and there is also often a monitor or mon button that temporarily disables squelch to allow us to hear weaker stations. Now let's look at some HF radios. All right, this doesn't really work well on the screen, so I'm going to have to take some pictures and show you the front of them. Both of these radios are multi-band, multi-mode, meaning that they operate on many bands and can modulate using different methods. The IC706 doesn't show as much because it's a newer radio and has a digital display, but the TS120S here has knobs on it that has more to show you. This knob here lets me select what band I would like to transmit on. Most of these radios are designed to operate on HF frequencies, so I have almost all bands below 30 megahertz available here. This knob here shows me what mode I'd like to operate on. It's got CW for Morse code, and then USB and LSB for upper and lower sideband. Squelch doesn't work very well for single sideband or CW, so different methods of reducing noise are used. The TS120 has a button for noise blanker, which is a simple noise filtering circuit. On more modern radios like the ones we use at camp, there are sophisticated digital methods for reducing noise. Neither radio on display here has obvious controls for filters, which are often used to filter out unwanted signals. The less bandwidth you need, the narrower the filter, with CW using a filter only 500 hertz wide. Single sideband often uses a filter of 2.4 kilohertz wide. What both radios have on display is an RIT function. This stands for Receiver Incremental Tuning, and is also known as a clarifier. If you know you're on frequency and the voice or CW tone sounds too low or too high, high, you can use this function to make it sound just right. This only works for CW and SSB transmissions. On FM, things just sound distorted and horrible if you're off frequency. If your radio doesn't have enough oomph to be heard, you can get something called an amplifier. Found more in HF than in VHF or UHF, they are handy if you are low in watts. And this is the only amplifier I've got at the moment. Unfortunately, it's only for FM. If it were a better amplifier, it would have a switch for CW use or single sideband use on the front panel. To use FM, you'd want it on the CW side of the switch. Again, this one's crummy, so I can't show you, and it's still the only amplifier I got. I, it's, a, it's a freaking black box, I'm, even though I'm showing you this. This is like the worst show and tell. If you want to operate on one band, but you only have equipment for a different band, you can get something called a transverter. It lets you transmit and receive on a different band than the one the radio is designed for. These are good if the band you want to use is something wacky, like high microwave, or if the equipment for the desired band is otherwise expensive. The only transverter I have is in this tiny software-defined radio dongle, so there's not much to show. Test question, though, so here we are. Now let's say you want to test a transmitter and make sure that it works properly, but you don't actually want to transmit and bother everyone in the world with your test signals. For that, there is the dummy load, and here's mine. This one's seen a lot of use, and it even has a built-in watt meter. Just run a feed line from your radio into this puppy, and it directly converts RF energy into heat, which is why mine has a heat sink. Just think of it as a big resistor. In fact, some heat sinks are just a bunch of resistors connected together, sometimes bathed in oil. Okay, so now I gotta talk about computers and radio. These digital modes are usually built on top of single sideband or FM, and there's a lot of them. Like, a lot, a lot. RTTY is one of the oldest and predates modern computing. Whisper is popular among Arduino types. Winlink is poorly named and good for MCOM. JT65 and MSK144 are good for moon bounce and meteor scatter. AX25 I used a lot as a kid, but it's not popular anymore. PSK31 is one of my favorites. PSK31 stands for Phase Shift Keying 31 Baud. Sounds slow, but it's a bit like IRC over HF. In fact, 802.11, otherwise known as Wi-Fi, can be modified to work on ham radio bands. The HamWAN project is here in the Puget Sound region and can create high-speed digital connectivity over very long distances. APRS stands for Automatic Position Reporting System. It mostly requires the use of GPS, but it's basically like a shared moving map. You can transmit location reports, weather information, SMS messages, all sorts of tactical stuff. There are even stations that connect the APRS network to the internet, called digipeters. This is very useful for MCOM. And very, very popular on ham radio right now is something called FT8. FT8, along with several other modes, is available from the open source WSJTX package. It is a fixed message, fixed timing mode designed to work in weak signal conditions. It's really quite good at picking up stations that nothing else can hear. And it is the song of my people!
problem is, it is a very fixed message passing system that doesn't really allow for conversations. Some folks think this isn't really ham radio. While I'm strongly inclined to disagree with that, I have to admit I like modes where I can have a conversation. That said, when I want to play with radios but I'm feeling real, real antisocial, FT8's where I go. To hook up a computer to a radio, the computer has to act like you do when you use a radio. It needs a way to talk, a way to listen, and a way to press the transmit button. Some radios, like the ones in the radio tent, have this built in and only need a USB cable to work. Other radios, like the ones we just looked at, need dedicated audio interface boxes. One idea, called this an AX25, but to be found in many digital modes, is the ARQ. It stands for Automatic Repeat Request because ARR would be confusing. If data isn't received properly, a receiving station can send an ARQ, asking the transmitting station to send the data again. It's basically going, what? when you didn't hear something. I could talk about error correction, retransmission, coding schemes, and feck for as long as I've recorded all of these other videos put together, but ARC is what's on the test, so that's what we're talking about. Also, I called this whole thing Packet Radio because AX25 and many other digital modes sends data back and forth in teeny tiny little packets of data. Let's very quickly talk about the quality of receivers. There's two main things when we talk about them. Sensitivity is the one most people think about when talking about the quality of listening. It's the ability to hear a quiet signal. The quieter signal you can hear, the better the sensitivity. But the other main one is selectivity. This is the ability to pick out an individual station in a group of other stations, to be able to zero in on a single signal. And that's way easier to say than I thought it would be. Think of sensitivity as the ability to hear a whisper, and selectivity as the ability to hear in a conversation at a party. To improve either of these, you can install something called a preamp between the antenna and the radio. Finally, let's talk power supplies. I have many here, and some of them are quite heavy. Most ham radio transceivers take DC power, and as we've discussed before, mains current is AC power. So to use most ham radios at home, you need something that converts AC to DC at the proper voltage. We call these things power supplies. I have my large linear 35 amp one, a smaller linear 3 amp one, and a lightweight but noisy 30 amp switching power supply. All of these are 12 volt. 12 volt is the power most radios require, as it is also the nominal voltage of the electrical system of a car. And yeah, I mean, if you're a car person, correct me on it, but you know what I'm talking about. As the radio takes up current, a power supply's voltage can sag, preventing proper operation. We call these power supplies unregulated. Other, better power supplies monitor their voltage and will make adjustments when voltage sags. We call these power supplies regulated. There's a shorthand calculation to figure out if your power supply is good enough for your radio. Take the maximum power output of the transmitter, divide it by the volts, and then multiply that number by two, rounding up to the next integer. So if I have a 100 watt transmitter that runs on 12 volts, I divide 100 into 12, giving me 8 and a third. Multiplying that by 2, I get 16 and 2 thirds, which rounds up to 17. I'd need a 17 amp power supply for that radio. There's some stuff we haven't talked about here, mostly about mobile power setup and batteries, so you're going to want to look into your book. But now that we've gotten over the hump of electronics and propagation, we had a simpler one this time. Remember, you can review these videos whenever you like, and you can take the example exam to see where you're going. Thanks for sticking with me this far, and I will see you next video. Beep, 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 boop, beep, beep, boop.